What's up, guys? Terry and Trey here, day two of training camp. What are you hearing? What's so we got on? three three things with the three young players, and this is kind of going into what happened over the weekend. So mm -hmm. first off, Mitchell Robinson, attitude issues. We're going to talk about that, what that means, if it's real. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Kevin Knox having a good practice today. Kevin Knox being I'm good. Very happy to hear that. <laughs> And everyone's favorite, practically you know, trade rumors. With, with the great hair and the GQ cover face. No, nah, she's not a lover crack. We're going to talk about basically those two things in this video. Let's get it started. Take notes. Big Beach. We're here. I'm at Alex It's different this time. All right, so first off, Mitchell Robinson, attitude issues. So I'm going to break this down, how it all started. A couple of days ago, we started hearing murmurs. And remember, this is silly season. Right now, everyone's like, been waiting for basketball for eight months. So we're just talking about everything. Right. And basically, when it comes to Mitch, these rumors and reports started coming out that they're not too happy with his professionalism. There was also a story going back to when Mitch got into the select team for Team USA. They got to play with uh, before FIBA like two years ago. He, he didn't take it as seriously. It was kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm on the they, team. All right. There were some rumors that the USA, um, you know, coaching team were a little bit miffed at how he acted. And I think that's just his personality. But Jeff Van Gundy was one of the coaches and he's really good friends with Tom Thibodeau. Right. So, and Tom is a very serious coach. You can feel the tenor and the vibe of the team right now. So right now, we're at an issue. We're at a point where there's this conversation about Mitch, Mitch's professionalism, well, his lack say, of professionalism, yeah. and what that means. And I think we, I think we both know he's not a regular guy. Right. But I think a lot of what he does can be misconstrued. What I think it's not attitude because when you see attitude, right. it comes off a little different, right? So I think what it is with Mitch is that he's sort of a young, sort of playful character. Um, probably doesn't seem doesn't seem like he takes things that seriously. Right. He also is an athlete that is naturally an athlete, so he probably has not had to work as hard to achieve some of the goals he's reached. Even getting into the NBA, he probably did not have to work as hard. I mean, he didn't go to college. So. Getting into the NBA, yeah. so for him, it's all sort of just happened. Now, I'm not saying that because of that he's not serious, but I think he definitely could come across as not so serious. Yeah. And he probably needs the right person because they keep asking him about Tibbs. You know, how do you feel about Tibbs? And he's giving these very general and generic answers. Oh, you know, he's going to be great on defense for us. He's going to help me with my defense. I'm a defensive player, so um, it's awesome to have him here. It's going to be great. But what I think Mitch really needs is an one individual person, one of those new training guys that we have on the team, to really kind of take him under, take him under their wing, and work kind of one on one. Kenny Payne, Kenny Payne got like ten he, people under his wing. I know, I know. He, he, he has a he has a wide, <laughs> ooh, a wide wingspan, right? But Mitch needs that. Mitch needs someone to kind of almost zone in and focus on him only. Him going through the coaches he's gone through with us already. Him now going through what four different ages? Six. So that's Six another thing, agents? right? Mitch just drops. That's a, Rich that's Paul, a lot. That's a lot. Kaiser Rossman. That's a yeah. lot because you know what you also need as a young player in this league. You you need someone that you can trust and rely on. It's a prop system around you. Right. So whether that's your agent, whether that's you know your friend that you hired to be your manager, whether that's your coach, one of the coaching assistant people, he needs that. Yeah. He definitely needs that. So I hope that someone there sees obviously the potential with him and is willing to work with him and take them under his wing. That's, so that, that's on, what I hope on that point, I think you you hit it perfectly because the best time of Mitch's time here in New York was with oh, DeAndre Jordan I, I during those couple few weeks. I knew you were going to say that. Right? DeAndre Jordan and Mitch and then DeAndre goes off the Brooklyn Trader. But <laughs> during that period of time, we saw the most improvement out of Mitch. He saw fouling as much, etc, etc, etc. He's saying some good things. I think they put him out today to talk after all the rumors because over the past few days, it's just been open season on Mitch about his a supposed lack of professionalism. And like you said, I think it's just his personality. I think we don't know him. Mm -hmm. If you haven't met Mitch or like get to know him, you can feel like it is something worse than it is. Once you get to know him, you realize this is this kind he, of who he, he is. He can come off as the class clown. He can. For sure. But he does. Now, a yeah. lot of times a class clown could be a really smart kid. Right. But they're not applying themselves. Right? So I think could he be. just needs to apply himself and he needs someone to sort of guide him in that direction. That's This, that's why this is the front office to do that. And I'll say this about people who are worried about Mitch. Mitch grew up poor in Louisiana, had this weird college experience where it didn't work out, went back home, trained for a year, 
He comes to the biggest market with the craziest fan base, the most media attention. With money now that he never had before. Not a lot compared to other players, but still, Mitch went from nothing to this. Three years in, basically, no issues. No There's drama. There's never been no a drama. drama. There's, There's no, no drama. drama. You've yeah. never been like, oh my God, Mitch is caught out here doing this. Mitch is doing that. Yeah. Mrs. Kirsten. None, none of that ever happened. So the kid is a good kid. All right. Let him be weird and quirky. The funny thing is, right, James Harden, who is not reported yet to Houston training camp, was at strip clubs the past two days, right? And the NBA also put out their protocol where you can't do that. So he's just getting it in before the season starts. James Harden can do that because he's gonna, it doesn't matter. They know he's gonna come and be crazy. So yeah. when it comes to a lot of like personalities in the NBA, that's why Kawhi gets away with it too, right? Right. If you've earned it, people are gonna let it slide. With Mitch, he hasn't earned it yet. So there's a lot more critical eyes on him, but he's gonna be okay. Up next, another guy who I've been worried about. Kevin Knox. Kevin Knox. Kevin Knox. Yes. Um, so we spoke about Knox before and we, you know, he, he's been, first year was pretty good, pretty okay. A lot of misses, but he played a lot of minutes, got to work out the case. Second year, horrible. Um, just didn't know what he wanted to do. He had a lot of the criticism from college where he's like floating in and out of the game, not paying attention as much as he should be. We get Kenny Payne in, so there's excitement. And okay, now he's got like this whole vibe. Guy, right? And Tibbs is reporting, Tibbs is reporting. Tibbs said today that Kevin has had two really good practices so far. Two out of two, he basically said, when Kevin takes good shots, they go in. So okay. obviously, sometimes he doesn't take good shots, which we know. Right. But um, it's exciting. I think Kevin Knox has been left to the wayside of it. So it's good to hear yeah. like some positive news coming out from Kevin. Well, I'm, I'm waiting to see because my um, thing with Kevin has always been, I felt like this lack of energy. Right. Right. Um, so I want to see a step up from that. I want to see what his improvements are. What are we in? He's, he's in his, his third year. Third year now, now yeah. So you, by your third year, you're supposed to be really making some improvements and, and kind of uh, blossoming, into, blossoming into the player you're going to be in the NBA. Yeah. Right? So we should have, if Tips is saying that he had two good practices, it's only two. Tips is not a guy too. He's not someone who just be saying that. Yeah. So, that means that that's going to be that's going to be good for him. The Kentucky connection is going to be good. So come on, Kevin, bring it, bring it on. We're ready to see you. We're ready to cheer you on for year three. I am. I, I, I listen. We saw Kevin Knox at summer league playing very well. Yes. Summer league, Kevin Knox. We're very excited. So I think he has it in him. Uh, I want to see how he plays without a garden crowd. Right. That's going to be interesting. Um, you know, we're that's, gonna, that's gonna benefit. That's so, so that gonna is actually gonna benefit some of the players and not benefit some of the players because some yeah. players uh, feed off of um, some players feed off of that. Just music. <laughs> Why did you say the button inside a minute? Some players thrive on having the energy in whatever arena they're playing in, hear, hearing the crowd, seeing people on the sidelines, and all that stuff. Yep. And then some players may play more comfortably um, during training. Yep. So playing now is going to almost kind of be like playing in training, even though obviously the other team is there. Coach it's a little bit there, different, so but it's yeah. going to be different. I agree. Yeah. Listen, I'll tell you this. Dennis Smith Jr. last year definitely struggled because of the crowd. Oh. Yes. We were and there. And was, the, crowd, the crowd was horrible. The crowd was really bad. I, I, I still blame Fizz. I still blame Fizz because Dennis Smith Jr. clearly wasn't right. He had made a ton of mistakes and Fizz kept putting him kept back him out there. While they're cheering for Frank. Put I Frank know. on, put Frank <laughs> on. Even Ennis we're cheering for and he's putting uh, him I, I, It was annoying that it came to between Dennis and Frank because it wasn't really that. It was more like this guy here, like we were tied and then Dennis Smith Jr. would come on and we'd lose the game. Huh, I think it's gonna be better this year. I wanna see how these guys play. Speaking of Frank, so trade rumors about Frank in the past few days as they're Always, oh, they're up, always up. every couple months. <laughs> now, the funny thing is about this specific Buddy Heel Sacramento King trade rumor is that I know where it started. It started on Twitter from a guy I know. I'm not going to give his information out, but he basically said, "Watch, I'm going to tweet this out and troll, and we'll see." And what create a story, right? And he, he did because that's that's what Twitter does. Create stories. created a story because it it comes out. Everyone's now commenting on it. Uh, in the uh, interviews that Frank did for Media Day, he had to talk about it. They said, what about the trade rumors? Which is funny because they really were not trade rumors. I right. think this front office is always looking at things to do. So maybe there are trades potentially happening, but it's not a point where it's like, oh, they're definitely just trying to trade Frank only. Right. Now, CP last night caught a lot of flack for this. I don't know why. Shout out to CP, killing it with Knicks fan TV. CP is not a guy. We, we know CP personally. CP is not a guy to just say stuff to say. He does not need the cup, right? right? If he hears something... He's going to relay the information. That doesn't mean he's always right. He, he's just going to report the news that he's hearing. He's going to report that he's right? hearing, right? Like very unbiased in a way. Exactly. So what he says is basically 100% there are trade rumors now between Frank and uh, and Sacramento. And I think Sacramento wants a pick and we're probably not going to want to give them a pick as well. So whatever it is. But going into year four, Frank is in an interesting position. 
again, it feels like every year it's like a rehash of the same thing. He's shown some progress. We don't know how much the front office believes in it. CP was reporting last night that Dennis and Alfred are really the main contenders. Frank is kind of to the side. Right. But Frank has honestly been to the side every year he's been here. Yep. You know, we go back to the draft, and I say this a million times, whoever drafts someone, especially if it's a project from a different country, that person is the one who had the vision for that. And that would be Phil Jackson. Would be Phil. Who left a couple weeks after I think Frank. one week. Okay, so a, week, week, after a week after the draft. So... First of all, that also makes us feel, you know, Frank was definitely drafted too high. We've said that many times. Yeah. If he was drafted at number 36, we would be fine with him. We Even in no the 20s, issues. honestly, I think he, he, was, no he was like 15. I don't think anybody would no really issues. care. Yeah. So the thing is, you know, Frank has sort of been given the shitty end of the stick, to be honest. He came in, he's now had, what, four coaches? So four coaches, three right? presidents. Yeah, it's been a lot. Right, he it's has ne he has never been given the true opportunity that you typically give a draft pick to play, right? Because you drafted this person, usually you kind of let them run wild, like let them play, see what they're gonna do. He was never really given that opportunity under Fizdale. He suffered the groin injury last year, as he started, or earlier this year rather, as he yeah. started to feel more comfortable and more confident on the court. Then we had we the entire league stopped. So it's like he's never been given a full, fair shot. And I know that we always stick up a Frank because we like him as a player. We like what he brings defensively. And we just like him. We he just like him. plays for the team. Like My thing is, the reason people like Frank is he's a team player. That's really it. He try, he's trying, you can tell he doesn't have some secret ego trying to score. He just wants to do, you know, what's right, right for the team. Yeah. Um, he, 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 like the, the big thing, the biggest thing for me with Frank is that he lacks confidence when he's on the court. Right? right, confidence is something that you're only gonna build after you play more. Enough, yeah. Right, so it's like with any like new job that you have, maybe the first few days on the job you're feeling a little nervous, or the first few weeks, or the first few months, everyone has a different like learning curve, right? Not that he's learning to play, he knows how to play, but he definitely doesn't have that air of confidence that sometimes you see a lot of the American players have. You have to remember that he came here from France. This was his second language. He was 18 years old when he came. I mean, his mom literally brought him here, set him up in an apartment, and then left. I think he lived with his agent for the first year or something. So, like so, so, so yeah. all of those things. And again, not to you know, not to try to like make excuses for him because to be honest, in his fourth year at this point, he does need to actually prove. And he will with the kids. Prove, prove his position. <laughs> <I'm kidding laughs> prove his position yeah. so that he can get the point composition point guard position if that's what he's going to play yeah because also with the position as basketball can't he move to the he, well position? i think i don't think frank's a point guard i think well, i mean i think he is a point guard but i don't think he's going to play point guard he's not for us i think he's going to play i think in the nba his end role is a marcus smart type marcus smart i always bring him up marcus smart would draft it higher than frank number six with boston none of these issues with, with marcus smart he's been a bad shooter his entire career he still can't shoot well frank actually shot better than marcus smart last year okay but boston loves him because they have a good team and he can do his role we've not had a good team play his role that's it right that's, that's it. it we've not had a good team so the things that frank does well right aren't really going to be shown the same way because we don't have a superstar now you go back to the draft phil jackson drafted him when chris Zingas looked like a superstar Right. And him and Chris Stapps played pretty well they together. They played pretty well together. If you look at that first season, right, even though Phil was gone at that point, early in the year when KP was going crazy and, like, took that jump, Frank and KP were playing well. We were winning games, yeah. so you saw that. Frank is an orphan stepchild of the franchise. Every single year, you basically see that the new ownership doesn't know what to earn. Or front office doesn't know what to do with him. They put him to the side, and then the side he somehow ends up earning his way back in. So I feel to me, overall, and all your points are valid, is that if Frank has been, if you draft a guy as a project, you have to come here. You gotta know that. Yeah, you gotta know that. It's gonna take more than four years even. I'm not saying you gotta resign in some big contract, but I would say the fact that we saw a big push from him last year, we saw a change, we saw better shooting, even if it was marginal. We saw him win games for us. We saw him against Dallas shutting down Luka Doncic in the clutch. We saw him get 20 and 10. 20 points, 10 assists in the second to last game before the shutdown. Youngest Nick ever with 20 points and 10 assists in a game. So to me, I'm like, you saw last year steps. So, you saw glimmers. I feel like, oh, man, you get rid of him now. And then he, like, now, like, he went through all, we went through all the hard times. It's like, like, like a couple, right? Girls always say, oh, I, I was with that guy when he was a piece of shit. And now he's like a good guy. And now he's with a different woman. I fixed well, him. Well, well, what I was going to say, <laughs> the, the, the girl is like, oh, I fixed him for the next one. It's, uh, what is it what is called? The, the, the starter wife. The the star the, I didn't know that. You're yeah, teaching, teaching me stuff. <laughs> so yeah, listen, that could be, I, it's annoying. And that doesn't make or break a franchise, right? If we trade Frank for Buddy Heald and Buddy Heald comes here and Buddy Heald's an excellent shooter yeah. and winning games, it was not really going to matter if Frank does well over there. Right. But from a, you know, we drafted him. We've worked with him all this time. 
I, for me personally, as much as I like Frank, I'm like, I would give him to like February, the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. Let's see this year if he picks up where he left off and does better. To me, if you get to the deadline and you're not seeing it from him, then yeah, I don't, okay. I actually like kind of don't care at that point. And if he gets traded, isn't he going along with Julius Randle? Yeah, Randall could be in that trade as well, which makes sense for Toppin. The Knicks posted a video today of Randall and Toppin together is trying to like get us used to the idea that Toppin's gonna pay the three, which I really don't like. But that's for another video. <laughs> that's the roundup. The three Knicks young players, RJ's been killing it. Things are good. Uh, I think it's okay. But we play Friday. Finally, There's it a won't game be. Friday, yes. <laughs> won't just be speculation. It'll be real cold hard facts. Thank you for watching, guys. Like, comment, subscribe.